Now we're recording. Oh, we've got the little red light of, of, of goodness. Uh, so yeah, we've just left Grand Sinclair's house. Yeah, what a guy. Really. Absolute GC. He's a good bastard, good typical Kiwi bloke, real humble guy. Was, um, yeah. He's fed me up on uh, red wine and it's been... <laughs> I've got the short straw of driving, but um, he's quite fond of a... Uh, a glass of red, which is uh, to Luke's. Yes, yeah, music to my ears, that yeah, is. Music, music, music to my ears. ears. So, yeah, so we're on the way back home, and uh, it was a fantastic conversation. I yeah. think we learnt a lot. Went really well, went for about an hour and a half, and um, sort of talked all about gone fishing and where it started and where he's going, and a bit about his life and stuff, and yeah, a few good catch stories in between, so... A little bit of hunting in there as well, so... Yeah, he's got some pretty... We've well, got some photos, some impressive heads on his wall and stuff, so he's got a pretty cool little man cave set up, and... Yeah, I think for, you know, for a guy we just rung out of the blue and said, you know, hey, can we come up? He was, said, yeah, if you want to come talk about fishing, bloody come for it. Come give it a go, so... So, yeah, so we hope you guys enjoy it, and uh, here's the original gangster. OG. The, the OG of uh, fishing TV shows in New Zealand and he was a pleasure to talk to so uh, enjoy this episode uh, episode number 2 and uh, we hope to bring you guys some more interesting stuff going forward but have a, have a listen and see how we get on we're off to the Rangariri enjoy welcome to the Fish on New Zealand podcast with your hosts, Tony Green and Luke Mason. Guess where are we? We've made the journey north. And so we're... come in a little bit because you were a little bit quiet last oh, time. I was, so I was. I hope that's better. Yeah, so yeah, go on. So we've made the journey north up from Hamilton and we're at Graham Sinclair's house up in Stillwater. So I don't know. We a Crusaders need... supporter. Yeah, contaminated we, by the Chiefs. He's made that very clear. And, um, yes, indeed. After last week's... He has put his flags down temporarily. Yeah, well, my <laughs> wife did. It wasn't me. After last week's efforts with the Chiefs, we don't have much ammunition to uh, <laughs> give him a bit of stick, but that's all right. We'll... Tony, Tony's already made an absolute fool of himself trying to start the fire. Golly, I would have thought a couple of Kiwi boys would know how to light a fire. Wrong. Yeah, I mean... I'm not there. Dismal fire. You must have gas in your house or something like that. <laughs> Thank God Sandy came down and fixed it. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I thought I'd get a bit of stick about this. I've lived you a few in my You'll life. You'll definitely but, get um, some stick. Yeah, the old man points aren't very high at the moment, but it's going there slowly. Just keeping us warm. Keeping yeah. us warm. We'll see how it's going at the end of the night. So you want to talk fishing? We do want to talk fishing. So I guess well, we, yeah, we want to know your story and how it started and oh, the whole nine yards. Give it to us. I guess, where did Graham, oh God! Where did Graham come into the world anyway? And stick up from there, I guess. I was born in 1956 in Redcliffs, and Redcliffs School was reopened yesterday. Oh, I saw that on the news. Oh, yeah. The yeah. earthquakes, yeah, 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 in Christchurch. Yep. So I went to the old Redcliffs School uh, and grew up beside the estuary that uh, is the tidal uh, lake, almost. That flows in and out by Shag Rock, yeah, yeah. Uh, near Sumner, between Sumner and Redcliffs. And I used to grovel around and gather sinkers at low tide and sell them back to the fishermen at high tide. <laughs> it was my first ever, ever business enterprise, probably about four years old. And from the proceeds of selling sinkers, and in those days you could sell soft drink bottles, I was able to buy a rod and reel and then subsequently bought uh, mass snorkel and fins so I began my diving career in filthy water um, because I thought if I can gather fishing sinkers at low tide by walking around, there must be a bloody mine of, of sinkers just to be picked up uh, below the low water mark. Yeah. Because hundreds of years almost, well, not hundreds of years, but you know, a couple of decades of people losing their sinkers, they, they'd, uh, they'd be there like a little treasure trove. Oh, and fantastic. indeed they were. Awesome. Entrepreneur, eh? Well, yeah, yeah it, was a, it was that entrepreneurial spirit. Oh, cool. And then did it progress on to war fishing from there? or from Well, for or? me, uh, the, the estuary was kind of a, a bit of a seasonal opportunity in some ways. And that it was, you know, there was flounders there all year round. And I used to go and drag for flounders off the back of a dinghy uh, with my father. 
Uh, but there was the white bait season that we all looked forward to. Oh yeah. And you know, you'd make a bit of number eight wire around a around a bloody uh, frame and put a, a net, stitch your own net into it, and pull up six white bait at a time. And <laughs> after about three hours of doing that, you'd have enough for a couple of patties. Oh, and it was um, it was hard work to get a feed though. Hard to get a feed. But there was the day where they ran, a day I remember vividly, and I just about filled that little net. Oh yeah! And it was sensational. That's awesome. So, so I mean, but I read reasonably avidly, and there were older anglers that would come and fish off the seawall in red cliffs, and some of them would have stories of things like chasing salmon in the rivers to the south, like the Rakaia and the Rangitata and in the Waitaki and Clutha and uh, even the, the Waimak which flows out just north of Christchurch. So um, with, with those stories from those old anglers uh, I started to think of going further afield. But you know my interest in those days was more, it kind of morphed into diving and hunting were, were my, my big things. Cool. So I've uh, got a car at 15 and pretty old one and what was fun. it it was a morris oxford oh, yes. 1956 same age as you same bloody age as me mate oh cool and uh yeah we, we had some great adventures in that old car first cars are always the best aren't they oh, you remember them right even but though they are generally the worst <laughs> you know, i hate to do in those days though but you know a jug of beer was 50 cents and the gallon of petrol was 50 cents oh yeah so you could do a lot of damage on a couple of bucks <laughs> Oh, awesome. yeah, it was great. That's fantastic. And uh, but my father had been a commercial fisherman out of Littleton. Oh, okay. Yep. And his father was a boat builder in Littleton. And his father was a fisherman boat builder. And his father was a boat builder. It's in the blood, isn't so it? So it was in the blood, yeah. Did you I, go out with him when you were young? No, no. He unfortunately uh, got a bit pissed and put, put the boat on the rocks and <laughs> lost his skipper's ticket early on oh, yeah. um, before I had a chance to go out. But... Uh, one of the vessels he skipped, Tawira, is actually still plying its trade in Nelson. Oh, okay. really? And Tawira has a bit of an interesting history. It was involved in a couple of rescues at sea. Yeah. You know, real old chugger. Yeah. That's oh, cool. cool. That's cool. And then you got more and more into the diving from there? Yeah, I did. I, you know, I was very excited about diving, uh, not just from the point of view of harvesting a feed, but you know, in those days, you, you actually fished or dived for tucker. You know, the idea of looking around and taking photographs didn't yeah. really have a great following. There was the odd person that would surface as a an underwater photographer or a, a landscape photographer, and you kind of cast a sideways glance and go, "Oh, God, I'm bloody greenies." Yeah. Uh, but as time went on, of course, you you changed your attitude. And you did start looking around more and, and appreciating the, the environment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've seen a, a great change from the idea of rape, pillage and plunder, that the ocean's your food basket, help yourself, yeah. to actually being well aware of the need for sustainable fisheries um, and, and careful environmental management. It's, you know, it's great to have gone through that journey. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I don't apologise for having, you know, taken my share yep. yeah yeah that's, that's totally fair enough and you know, I think we can sort of see that in your um, development through gone fishing to uh, ocean bounty and, and you sort of explore all those different avenues don't you well one of the things that I think is really important is that having had quite firm opinions about things in the past the one thing that I'm very aware of now is the need for people to have a conversation you know, if we all extract from that big pond out there, you know, commercial fishers, recreational, customary, uh, and, and also if we interact, like, the, you know, we're, we're represented heavily in, in environmental groups, um, you know, we all need to sit around and have a conversation. So the conversation should focus on, to me, what's best for the fishery and what's best for the environment in terms of the way we interact. And, and with that premise in mind, you know, it should be easier to have a, a more cohesive combined focus. Yep. Let's do what's best. Yeah, it makes Let's sense. Let's ensure our kids inherit 
sustainable fisheries and uh, sound environmental practices. It's not rocket science. I guess it's like every, anything, isn't it? You, we want to be able to pass on uh, something good onto the next generation rather than just nothing. Yeah, but not at the expense of any one group. You know, the, as recreational anglers, sometimes uh, we tend to be a bit staunch about, well, bloody commercial. Well, commercial fishermen have come a long way in 30 years in particular since the quota management system came in. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm just saying that for the you know, 50, 60, 70% of the population to get their seafood through the commercial fishing industry, for us to, to suggest that commercial fishing should stop is just totally unrealistic and unfair. Yeah. And the other thing is commercial fishermen make a living. And some of them are just small, almost artisan fishermen that have a right to make a bloody living and have got to feed their families. Yep, and that's true. So comes back to having the right conversation with the right group of people and doing what's best. Cool. And industry is good for the country moving forward. Like Absolutely. It's not just the people catching the fish. You've got the people maintaining the boats and the factories and um, the transport people and, yeah, everyone to the but person it, selling it behind the supermarket counter. Or I, I've and, filmed an ocean bear. Well, you know, we've filmed a number that have really opened my eyes. But it's like going to fishing university, really. It's an absolute privilege to do what I've done. You know, for 27 years of gone fishing, yeah. and for the last four or five years of ocean bounty. Yeah. Absolute privilege. Because some of the people that work in the marine environment are just incredible. You know, the innovation that we've seen off the record before we spoke about SPAT NZ. Yeah. You know, and they're effectively raising SPAT, muscle SPAT, that in turn are being sewn into the muscle farms. And uh, great, reliable, consistent um, seed uh, for an industry that's been coming very, very important to us, both in terms of local markets and export markets. And God, you know, we're great innovators. We really are. And if people can hear a bit of a noise, we're in my man cave, and there's dead deer hanging off the bloody walls. That's pretty impressive. And Guns everywhere. Fish. Yeah, and there's old yeah. rifles. We might not get off this property yet. We're not sure. <laughs> so that's what the rattling is. I might just close that door, eh, so the, uh, the windows... Oh, God. Right. Keep Sandy out, dear. Yeah. Good luck with <laughs> that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I'm really excited about the fact that, that, that I was sufficiently privileged to be born in a country called New Zealand. You know, wow. How lucky have I been as an... You, know, you don't get many bloody votes for being a, an ageing, white, disabled Kiwi male. But you know what? I'll put my hand up and say, just being born here was enough for me. And even though my bum points to the ground and has for, shit, 22 years now, hasn't stopped me getting out. No, nah, shit, no. We've got I mean, a pretty incredible And backyard. neither should it. Mm. Yeah, no, it shouldn't. You should have a great time and... I mean, the stuff that you've done over that those times and, and is is amazing. And yeah, like Tony says, your backyard is you've got it there, and you might as well enjoy it. Yeah, but you see, the thing is about disability. The thing that 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 is perhaps often little understood is that it very much epitomises teamwork. If you're to be successful as a person with disability, there's always a, a team that is providing support somewhere in the mix. Um, someone steps up to the plate and gives you a hand. Um, although we try desperately to be independent, uh, it's really the, the care, concern and support of others that does help one hell of a lot. Oh, cool. Well, it's good to hear. It is. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, should we take it back a step and understand gone fishing and how... You got into that and the idea behind it. October 1991, National Research Bureau survey on recreational fishing. It said 914,000 Kiwis over the age of 16 went fishing at least once a year and they spent $745 million annually in association with the support. Well, that was no freaking drop in the bucket, both in terms of the populace yep. and in terms of the expenditure. 
and yet there was no television show about fishing at, the, at that time. Largest, largest recreational pursuit in the country, why no tally? So a group of us uh, took uh, submissions to both networks and in the end TV3 picked it up and then we made the mistake of cutting a pilot show and the head of programming at that time for Deluded Soul took a look at the bloody uh, pilot show and said, nah, don't like it, cancelled us. So we'd been given a time slot and then three cancelled. What what didn't he like about it? Honestly, it was bloody good fishing. Part of the clip was uh, in Vanuatu and we'd taken... Four brand new when T- Chamano Tiaguas were new. Yeah. These game fishing reels up to um, Port Vila and Vanuatu. And we came out of bloody Port Vila Harbour, turned right towards an island called Hat Island. And when we got close to the island, I'm looking in the bloody distance and I'm going, geez, what's that boiling all over the ocean? And the next thing, bang, all four lures went off. Oh. And it was yellowfin tuna as far as you could see. Well, Foreign fishing fleets have devastated the population of bloody yellowfin in the Pacific, just hammered them. But then it was just unbelievable. So we filmed this action with yellowfin bloody leaping everywhere and hocking up, screaming reels. And that's, that's what they rejected. It's some of the best bloody fishing I've seen. Yeah, you can't get much better than that. Before and since. Wow. You know, it was incredible. Just, yeah. just happened to get a guy in a network didn't that didn't fishing. understand fishing. Yeah. And that, sometimes that sort of stuff happens. So then our first stint, the first 13 shows of Gone Fishing, actually went to where on TVNZ. Oh, yeah. It was TV1. Okay. But and that was at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And then after that, and it did quite well, which surprised everybody. Oh, yeah. You know, everything's about ratings in television. Yep. And uh, next thing I got a call from TV3, or we got a call. It wasn't just me in those days. Uh, and uh, they said, oh, we'd like to revisit the idea of this bloody oh, fishing We show. made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, we might have buggered it up. Yeah. How would you like five o'clock on a Saturday? Yeah. And, and away it went. Oh, perfect. Five or 5.30 on Saturday. Primo time. Which is perfect because it's off peak. And in television, if you're peak, you've got the network looking over your shoulder because, you know, they're prime time. Yep. They want to make sure you're doing... What's going to rate? Selling advertisers. So to you TV. get some bloody television executive poking their nose in and telling you how to make your program. Yeah, true. And I don't like that very much. I like to make the program the way I like to make the program. Um, but in the early days, there was a cast of thousands. Or the idea for the show really was a belonged to a guy by the name of Mike Barner at a company called Wild Film and Television, um, and he had a television production company. Um, thought he had a lot of work on the, on the books it, a lot of it dissolved but that survey on recreational fishing uh, gave us the in um, to kick off the fishing show and the only reason I wound up in front of the camera is because we didn't have enough bloody money to pay any other poor bastard to do it <laughs> so I, I had a crack at it and the guy that was the executive producer at the time was a chap by the name of Larry Keating and Keating said to me, because I was a bit wooden in front of the camera, it's the learn skills. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's about practice. It's hours in the middle, you know, as if you were playing bloody cricket. And Keating said to me, mate, when you look at that bloody camera, just imagine you're talking to a friend. And from that day on, it was easy. Yeah. I look at the camera, g'day, mate, and away we go. Yeah, you, you probably get the buy-in from the audience then as well, because you feel like... You're being spoken to on the other side of the TV, directly by you. Well, well, I guess so, but the other thing is, you know, it's so easy to be enthusiastic about something that you love. True. And as I will always say, I love this bloody country with a passion. I'm about as passionate a Kiwi as you'll ever find in your bloody life. But to, but to then be able to immerse myself in outdoor New Zealand in a myriad of forms has just been a bloody blessing. So why the hell wouldn't you love it? And so if your passion comes through, I guess it's easier to actually tell a positive message. That's cool. 
I've been going back and having a look at some of the old clips and uh, yeah, it was awesome. You, you're doing a bit of four by fouring and uh, going down on the beach and casting off. I think it was in Wellington or something like that. Oh, you gave one of the guys a, a bit of an earful for throwing his fish back in the water. Oh, <laughs> you go. Oh, those were the days. Chocolate yeah. fish cost tuppence, six feet long. Had to head and tail them to get them in a bloody wheelbarrow. Those were the days. Oh no, it was, it was yeah. It was, I was, I was saying to Tony like, um, you know, you're the original guy, and, and when you think of fishing shows, I mean, that's who I, I think of you. And I'm sure a lot of people, our generation, probably do as well. Uh, and then you, you've spawned on this sort of, almost like this, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Cult sort of. Uh, almost serious because there's about five or six of those oh there's a heap of them yeah. but but the thing is if your mug's on tally you tend to get the attention but it's pretty much the same message as with disability the reason I'm able to do what I'm able to do is because I have the right team around me well it's the same with making television it's never one person it's a team game and if you've got the right team it's amazing what you can achieve you know, in my current round, I've got Sandy, of course, who cracks the whip uh, and can light a hell of a lot bloody better fire than your old mate. <laughs> um, Speaking of which, Tony, it's, uh, it's yeah, still going, going, but... Uh, you better put another log on the fire there, son. I better not let it bloody go out. But, but the other one is, um, you know, I've got Mel Williams, who's been my regular uh, camera, cameraman, come bloody field director, come all sorts of things, for God knows how long. And he has to to cope with helping me in and out of vehicles and boats, and you know sometimes things go a bit astray. And I've I've had a year of trying to had a bad year actually trying to get over a the flu which tried to kill me. No COVID nineteen, it was just influenza A. And then I had a bloody pressure wound go bad, and I you know, I die nor stuff like that. Ha! Huh, health problem. Like, yeah, that bullshit. Just keep going, you know, keep yeah. going. But eventually, Catches you pay it. a price. And I paid a big price. So five operations later, there was a hole in my ass. Um, Sandy said you could have dropped three golf balls in it and the first <laughs> one would bounce off the bone. Oh. So that's how deep it was. It was an ugly freaking mess. Ouch. And so right now, as we speak, I'm 11 months in and it's basically just about healed but that's how long it took Ooh, wow so you know life today. serves up some speed bumps it's never plain sailing but it's how you cope with some of those things that t- dictates outcomes and like you say that having that team with you makes the right it easier. bloody team so you know people like mel williams and you know sandy and my son james who has to you know occasionally suffer going out with the old man yeah um <laughs> And wherever we go, you know, we get great support. Brilliant. It's great. Brilliant. It's good to see you carried it on too. You know, it's always would have just been easy to throw it all in and go, well, that's the end of it. But uh, Well, yeah. well is, it, is it easy to chuck it all in though? You know, I, I mean, you could say you're given a choice when the going gets tough. The choice is to, oh, too hard, give up. Well, then what happens? Probably Groundhog Day, I would expect. Every day is like the day before. It's not Boring as batshit. Not the key or the day. you keep bloody going and you make the best of it. Exactly. And wow, do, do opportunities pop up. It hasn't held you back either. It's done some amazing things. Oh, so. What the hell? Mm. What the hell? <laughs> cool. cool. So, and that, so that was 26 years of gone fishing. Yeah. And I was trying to encourage James to become more involved yeah but it's not his thing but he's about to go to sea um, on the new Sea Lord factory tour to Katu so next week he's doing a course at the commercial sea for a commercial fishing school in Westport uh, and then he'll be on board and part of the crew is that the big one that was built up in Norway was it or yes was it? yeah yeah it's pretty so, impressive vessel, yeah yeah it, it is so he's going down into the Southern Ocean, uh, chasing Southern blue whiting. Wow. Oh, cool. That's a, I mean, that's, 
still following the, your footsteps in a way, isn't it? Well, well, it's his own path. Yeah. Um, but the the, the bugger's going to have to learn to get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. Fantastic. How did it go from? Um, did, were you still working when you did season one as well? Is it or was it straight into it? And well, well, there's a group of us had a group of companies, and I was uh, involved. I'd set up a management training team building company, um, and you know Mike Barnard turned up with a, a television company, and we formed a group uh, called Frontier Holdings. Mm-hmm. With had all these ideas of grandeur, but uh, after a short period of time, it it was clear that we were better as individuals than as a group. Uh, and the first series of uh, Gone Fishing made a bloody big loss, effectively. So everyone's going, oh, shit, this will never work. And so I took over Gone Fishing partway through series two uh, and became executive producer, producer, director, and all the cameraman and presenter. So instead of having all those people uh, sitting, drawing a salary, um, suddenly there were five jobs. Paid yourself five times. <laughs> well, I wish there was that much money, but the bloody never is. Oh, that's and, awesome. I mean, that's the, the funny thing. If the, I haven't made a fortune. I've been lucky enough to buy a couple of properties at the right time. And that's kind of got me through. And that's why it's good, nice to be sitting in the man cave. Yes, uh, I, I couldn't buy a property like this now. But... What would I do if I'd focused on making money? What would my dreams and aspirations consider, uh, consist of? Well, I would say my dreams and aspirations would have consisted of doing more fishing and diving and hunting. But I would have been 20 years older uh, and it wouldn't have quite been the same. So what I did is rather than focus on making money, I focused on doing the best job I could in the areas that I loved the most. And you managed to have a, a and enjoyable I to life. Scrape through doing what you love. It's the it's the ultimate dream at the end of the day. What isn't could it? be better? Exactly. That's and great. I think too that you know we encourage our kids to get an education. Bloody important. We encourage our kids to go through school and then maybe get to university. Well, okay, but that doesn't work for every kid. You know, it's nice to see of late that more is being made of the idea of apprenticeships mm. uh, because a lot of kids think differently. You know, my son James, he wouldn't mind me telling you, he doesn't think like a bloody academic, but give him a bag of nails and a piece of 4 two, and he'll build you the Eiffel Tower. You know, he's a practical kid, and man, is he good on the boat. He's an absolute natural um, on the boat, sorts out the electronics in 30 seconds flat. He's just got a mind that works that way, but he wouldn't have learned that at university. Yeah, I think so, there's, a, there's a lot of people like that, and, and you're right, it is, it is good that people are exploring these, because for a long time, and in a lot of countries, they're just pushed towards university, 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 and it's not always the right thing to do. No, it's not. Well, I remember when I left school, I was uh, what, year 11, so fifth form into that, and I had an apprentice line, apprenticeship lined up for engineering, and I had to get written permission from my old man to leave school, and the principal pretty much told me I was a failure and a dropout, you know, and then you listen on the radio now, and they're trying to get everyone to do an apprenticeship. Yeah. Thing. And I'm well ahead of, you know, there's people that got high distinction in maths and all that, and you see them today, and they're... I don't know, they've got the personality of a bloody block wall and it doesn't get you anywhere, you know, so... Mm. Well, you know, I, th- I think that the more time passes by, the less interaction we seem to be able to have with people. You know, I'll phone an organisation and it, it's increasingly difficult to talk to a human being. You get freaking electronic messages and then you put on hold for the next 30 minutes. Well, get stuffed. Yeah. I'm not interested in that shit. I want to talk to someone. And so I don't think that, you know, for most of us, we need company. And it's good to, to tell stories and it's good to share the adventure and journeys that we've, we've, um, we've been able to enjoy. But also, of course, to encourage our youth then... Uh, to have the same sorts of adventures, I think will enrich their lives. Not Very shut them so. up with a bloody phone or some gaming console or God knows what else. God forbid. 
but to actually get out and interact Maybe. with the wonderful resources we have in this country. More kids out bloody getting sinkers out of the estuary like you did. You know, well, yeah, I guess. Chasing ground around. And you know, I, I remember the first time I, you know, I thought I was a pretty good hunter and I went to, the first time I went to Fiordland, I, um, I, I learned in a hell of a hurry that I wasn't quite as shit out as I thought I was. You know, the first time it rains 12 inches of rain in 12 hours or something, and the river levels come up, you know, five, six, seven, eight, ten metres and try and wash your camp away. It's, um, it's a big wake-up call. And you go, hmm, I better learn some more skills here. And uh, at the end, that's a great journey. And then two or three years down the track, suddenly you've got something that's you can hang on the wall, and it's, it's a great memory. Well, you certainly got a few of those around. Yeah, they're not all mine. Um, the one above the door there, that was a um, very good friend, Richard Hayes, Sir Richard Hayes, Hannibal, chopper pilot in Tiania. He and I have been mates for 40 years. Uh, it's his. And I shot that one over there in the, the white-tailed deer in, in the States. The big guy, I'm sorry, the people listening to this can't hear, but it, um, it's a 12 point watt, 50 inches by 40 Shot in the Glazenock River by Alex Sutherland in 1934. Uh, it's the, the last year that uh, Wapiti, which were gifted to us by President Roosevelt in 1905. Wapiti is an American Indian name meaning white deer. 34 is the last year they were shot under licence, so that's significant. And then my big fella there, um, he got a hell of a fright when I put a bullet in his neck. Um, I shot him in about 1983. Um, 42 inches long, 49 inches wide, 17 points. Good enough for me. So and, and it's not that, you know, people think, oh, yeah, bloody trophy hunter, you know. Oh, what's all this bone doing? Well, I shot the middle deer there. It's the only deer that tried to kill me. So I thought, bugger you, mate, you're going on the wall. <laughs> so that, that was that one. And then this, the other guys, the biggest deer I ever saw in the Fiordland bush, and then the one I shot in the States was on a, a, a friend's property. And um, I'd taken them hunting and diving in Fiordland. So, but that's, that's enough for me. You say great before, memories and great adventures. Yeah, yeah stories. Before, you, yeah. Haven't, you haven't made a massive fortune or anything, but you've, I think it's false and maybe in the way of money, but the memories and things you've got on the wall are more valuable to the certain different people. Well, you know, it's bloody... Uh, you know, I look around this, but it's a shame that people can't see it. A, we'll take some photos, we can put them on yeah, the website. Yeah, okay, well there's an ammunition belt hanging up there above that deer photo. Uh, and that was my old friend's Rolly Williams. Rolly Williams was a tail gunner and a Lancaster bomber during the Second World War. Um, and that belt buckle on that ammunition belt, which was his recreational hunting belt, was actually his Air Force belt buckle through the war. And he gave that to James, my son. Yep. There's not a mark on it, it's just a piece of brass. But you know, that's flown missions over Germany and Tell dropped bombs story. over bloody Europe and it's just a little piece of brass. Got, got a lot of character. Got a bit of history and yeah, but, it's fantastic. But he was, he was a mentor to me, he actually tried to adopt me. Um, home at times was a pretty interesting place and uh, the old fella thought he could provide me with a better home. But his wife wound up getting multiple sclerosis the disease that I've got, and she died. So that was the end of the adoption. And then bugger me, you know, here I am, age 40, and I get multiple sclerosis. You never know what's around the corner. No, you don't. No, you, don't. you don't. I mean, and, and the recent events of COVID is exactly that. No one knows, you know, for the whole world to be shut down almost overnight was just, yeah, what what... What is around the corner is, is exactly, you don't know. So you might as well enjoy it as best as possible. Well, yeah, sure as hell, may as well. But every time during lockdown I'd come down to the man cave, it was like going to a different country. You know, it's like, wow, yeah, great. Great change of scene. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yep. Cool. Well, um, I was just thinking, uh, you know, the gone fishing, that, that, I mean, that's been amazing and, and, and it's obviously treated you well for, for a long period of time and, and it's only... In the more recent years, you started looking at the, the ocean bounty side of things? Yeah, just, just one thing on, um, on the gone fishing thing. Gone fishing enriched my life. Very early on in the piece, 
I became patron of Police Blue Light, which effectively is like the you know youth arm of the police, but it's broader than that. Blue Light's its own organisation. They used to be famous for discos. Uh, that's how they started. Now they run a lot of youth camps and uh, we started running uh, Kids Gone Fishing Days. We've had tens of thousands of kids out with their parents and caregivers uh, fishing off wharfs and boats, you know, you know, off the beach, you name it. And so that's a bit like that. It's a practical example of don't just talk about getting kids out. Don't just talk about interacting with bloody outdoor New Zealand. Make it happen. Hmm. So, you know, it's been a real privilege for the last 20 plus years to be able to do that. So the organisations are there uh, offering it and... and Yeah, we run about 10 kids fishing events a year Mm -hmm. um, through Blue Light. uh, And, you know, there might be one in your area and maybe not in Hamilton. The lake's not so good, (laughs) but uh, certainly near Blue Light. A few ducks. (laughs) Yeah. Plenty of koi carp in the river. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I and mean, there's you know there are lots of great youth organisations that are geared towards enriching the lives of our kids. And that's awesome because not everyone gets the opportunity. Or has a dad or an uncle that takes them out on their boat no, or off the water. No, they or, don't. Yeah. So it's a pretty awesome thing you guys are doing there. Well, you know, there's a, there's a great many Kiwis that do similar things. There's all sorts of mentor programs and things around the place. And then he takes that one kid, he see him on the wharf, and it just he gets that disease of fishing, and it's um, it's a, it's li- a life for sen- life. Uh, yeah, a life sentence buying tackle well, every Well, you know what? Weekend. What is it that kids desire most of us? What's the one thing they desire most? I'll answer for you. It's easy. It's time. It's just bloody time. But we get so busy and so wound up uh, on this treadmill of ours, this life because there are so many things we're required to do, that time is often lost. And suddenly you go, shit, what happened to the last 20 years? Well, in that 20 years, your kids have grown up. Mm. Yeah, yeah it's an interesting, time. yeah, it's an interesting perspective. Given time. And it's, uh, it's good to hear that, you know, people are still thinking, I mean, personally, I've been fairly privileged. I've had a good, you know, relationship with my dad and my mum and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And they've given us the time to do what we want to do and, and teach us these things exactly like fishing and um, I'm sure Tony's had pretty much the same so a similar sort of upbringing but as you say there is a lot of people out there that, that haven't had that and for you know organisations like yours to, to assist with that is fantastic yeah you know I guess it's when your mug's on tally you do have an opportunity to do good things to help people why the hell shouldn't you hmm you know, this this, this business, this journey's been good to me. The least I can do is give something back. That's fair. That's a fair shout. Fair shout, Cobb. Yeah. Your fire's actually going all right, Tony, so... Bloody, bloody fluke. <laughs> Relieved. <laughs> God, Sandy, put a couple of logs on me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so, Ocean Bounty... Yeah, Ocean yeah, Bounty. How did that come about? Because that's a lot different to gone fishing. It's sort it, of it, it is. from the and recreational over to the commercial side. In a and way. the honest truth is that one of the guys from one of the fishing companies, um, Andrew Talley, approached me and said, what do you think about this idea of doing some stories about the commercial industry? And I'd, I'd already been doing some, just every now and again to drop a commercial story in the gone fishing mix. Because I just felt that we, instead of keeping the group separate, we really needed to be talking more, we needed to be sharing ideas. And if we both were both to have a slice of the pie, uh, we needed to understand what that should look like and how big a slice that should be. Um, and so I, I met with Andrew and I said, mate, the deal would be that I've got to tell my stories. If you've got some ideas, I'd love to explore those ideas, but I will not... I will not be influenced to tell what you would like told. I'll tell it exactly the way I see it. And he said, wouldn't ask you to to see it any other way. And they have never once, no one in the commercial industry has ever asked me to tell the story other than in the way that I see it. That's good. that, That to me is testimony to the fact that what they want to do is they want to 
you know, they, they want to do the best job they can. And they'll freely admit when, when they've made a mistake. And those, Christ, we all make mistakes. Hmm. And not every recreational angler I know um, necessarily does things by the book. You know, we're fallible, we're human beings. We make mistakes. Yeah. But we've got to get better. Got to get better at it. And you can and, learn from each other and as you, well. And, and you bloody well do. Sustainable fisheries, sound environmental practices, and looking to improve both all the time. And you get organisations that we've filmed like through um, Ocean Bounty, like Plant and Food and Nelson and Cawthron Institute and you know those sorts of organisations. Um, NIWA. There's all these bloody scientists running around doing incredible things, hmm. amazing things, and, and developing products and innovations that reduce bird mortality and you know sea lion deaths and... Um, and, and encourage uh, better uh, harvesting techniques and you know more selective fishing and it's just phenomenal what we're able to do and we are world leaders. I watched the um, the one in the sounds with the salmon. And yes, that was that was mind blowing to me. Like the way they were they were almost tricking the fish into summer and winter, and then they would take the eggs and they'd you know uh, get them in the farm and all that sort of stuff. And, and at the end of it is, it is literally an in, industry world leading product from such a small piece of New Zealand and, and, and even in the sounds it was such as, I remember, I, I can't recall the, the numbers but it was like 17 hectares or something like that. Yeah, a small piece of real estate yeah. providing an incredible return. Yeah. And now they're looking at you know ocean farms, so getting the farms outside of the, the, the protected waterways and submerging them um, so that they can harvest in the open ocean more effectively. Mm. Well, within reason, you know, coast, close to the coast, but certainly further afield. It's just incredible stuff. Yeah, it's very, very cool. There's, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of smart people out there thinking of ways that, that you know, the industry and all of us can be sustainable and have something for the future, right? But then also you look at some of the interactions between commercial and recreational. One of the classics at the moment is in the Hauraki Gulf with the mussel farms over towards Coromandel. And the bloody mussel farmers hate the snapper. Why? Because they put the spat out in the lines in the afternoon and by morning they're bloody gone because the snapper have eaten them. So they want the, the, the recreational guys to come over there and haul their bloody snapper out of them out of the bloody mussel farms. And when they're harvesting, sometimes the water is orange with them. This is boiling with snapper. With snapper, yeah. Just boiling with bloody snapper. So you just drop a bait down, boom, it's good you're hooked fishing. up. Good. It's bloody great fun. It's a good way to take someone that's never been into fishing and or kids and that you, you sort of guaranteed a nice, like not a slow day, you know, take them out oh. and it's exciting and that's mind-blowing. But what a great interaction. Yeah. You know, commercial <laughs> operators are benefiting by the fact that recreational are coming there. And also, the recreational guys know that um, it's a turkey shoot because all the bloody snapper, you know, for God knows how many miles, are concentrated in one area when they're harvesting. Yeah, it's definitely a good fishery, though. Isn't it? Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. It's a beauty. Just park up beside the, by, beside the boat as they yeah. pull them out of the water. <laughs> Away yeah. you go. I just don't think they appreciate the old soft bait jig heads cast at the head. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, and there's etiquette with some of these things too. You know, understanding the, the need that, well, the fact that the guys have got a job to do and you've got to leave them free to do it yeah. uh, and be careful with your interaction. They're pretty good though if you communicate with them and, you know, yeah, too way, you're right. the point where you want to fish and they usually give you the thumbs up or the thumbs down. It's not, not rocket science. No. Yeah. No, it's all good. Yeah. So, has there been any, uh, you know, any? I haven't watched all the all the uh, ocean bounty stories, so I must apologise. But has there been any that you've? It's opened your eyes to a to a negative or to a positive that you hadn't seen the side of that before, or? Well, the, the Spat NZ scenario that we come back to going to Spat NZ just out of Nelson, and seeing how that the ability to to seed stock consistently leads to more consistent harvests, leads to a more productive shellfish fishery, uh, and 
consistent export opportunity and consistent jobs. You know, that whole, the way everything kind of works and meshes together for a better outcome is really impressive in that example. Okay. The salmon farming is another example. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the, you know gee, it kind of goes on and on a little bit. Um, Cawthron Institute and Moana combined to uh, produce oyster spat. And the oysters that are coming from that Moana spat and Cawthron's research, uh, Timatuka oysters, my, my very good friend who's just recently passed away, um, uh, owned uh, Timatuku oysters. Um, so Rob Fennick, uh or had a, a, a big hand in, um, in setting Timatuku up. And, and it was the spat from Moana that actually has produced these incredible bloody oysters. And I, being a good southern boy, you know, bluff oysters are bloody it. I, and then, and Rob Fennick used to say to me, you go, Graham, you've got to try my bloody oysters, mate. They're as good as bluffs. Oh, come on, Rob. Nothing's as good as bloody bluffs. Well, <laughs> he, he took me out to Waiheke, and I, honestly, my bloody eyebrows must have flown off the top of my head when I tasted that first Timatuku oyster. Oh, yeah. They are sensational. Awesome. Delicious. And these are, you know, from hatchery red spat, the Moana spat, um, that finds its way into other uh, opportunities and other hatcheries as well. But Sir Rob Fennick introduced me to Timatuku, and you can go and get them and order them over the bloody internet, and they are magnificent. I might have to do that, actually. And not seasonal. Oh, really? You know, the bl- I mean, look, I'm, I'll be on, on the bloody phone to Graham Barnes down in Invercargill and ordering my feed of bloody blasts. Don't worry about that. But to be able to get consistent, good quality oysters year-round, fantastic. Yeah, that's awesome. Good so, you know, a product of, of innovation, of research, and of groups working together for the betterment of an industry, providing jobs. And I guess those, uh, in, the, in those sorts of scenarios as well, they're probably having to front load a lot of that um, money or that capital and they're potentially losing money to start with until they build up what Ab- they're doing, right? Absolutely. And, and yeah, I guess showing Huge investments where they're at these things. with that innovation and investment is a really cool yeah. thing to see. But, you know, one of the key areas of interaction and potential conflict is the inshore fishery uh, where we've got, you know, trawlers and, and quite often they're you know, just uh, family operations feeding into one of the fishing companies uh, where they either have some limited quota of their own and buy in or lease other quota. Um, and and they're just honest people trying to make an honest living in the hope of... I mean, if, if the commercial industry was out to rape and pillage and pillaged a resource, what would there be to harvest next year? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. So, of course, they're interest. not going to do. They have that. an obligation, yeah. yeah to yeah. We, we all need to make sure our activities are sustainable, and the inshore fishermen are getting pretty bloody good at it. But they're being pushed around all over the place, absolutely pushed here, there, and everywhere. And one of the classics, of course, is with the Maui and Hector dolphins. Uh, and you know, I'm absolutely all in favour of ensuring that our activities look after you know, our, our, our natural environment. And the dolphins are a classic example. Who doesn't enjoy interacting or seeing dolphins? But at the same time, we want to make sure that our, our fishing industry can function sustainably with appropriate environmental practices uh, and that, that those small businesses, that, you know, those guys that are going out and uh, setting a net or a long line are actually able to feed their families going forward. And they're not having to be to get pushed around too far. They're not having to go far and wide when we've got uh, plenty of decent stock close at hand. We need to know more about the movement of dolphins. We need to know more about our ability to separate fishing activities from them. There are things that commercial guys use in the deep water called dolphin pingers. And the dolphin pingers keep the bloody uh, dolphins out of the nets. Um, so it's a mess with their sonar or something. Yeah, yeah, we're just... 
it's just a noise a they don't signal. like. Okay. Yeah. So maybe if we were set netting it in inshore, maybe there's some device yet uh, that we can innovate and develop that will actually ensure that separation. You know, that that's where working together, everyone around the table, for the betterment of the fishery and for the environment, we, we can develop answers that work for everyone. And I don't think we're quite there yet. Mm. And the good thing about I've noticed about watching Ocean Bounty coming from a recreational point of view is you, I guess you you sort of hear all these stories and but these are things that happened thirty twenty five years ago and stuff like that and people get that stigma stuck into them oh bloody commercial fishing you know it's the raping and pillaging but then it goes both ways you look back recreational fishing thirty years ago you know it was if you caught it and it came over the boat it was in the bin and you know sharks got a bloody whack to the head and it was bloody you know you, you can't it's, the recreational fishers aren't perfect either you know and both both sides of the table have come a long way when, we know, we have. Way. We have, and, and by sharing time together and better understanding our, our respective objectives, which are often pretty much the same, uh, we can make further and rise and get better at this. That's my hope for the future. That's cool. That we do sit around the table, we do have conversations with the right people. There's a, the, a couple of groups around the country, one being Te Korowai and Kaikoura, another one being the Fiordland Guardians, and they both have this phrase they use, which is gifts and gains. If you're sitting around the table and you want something, you have to also think about what you are prepared to give just to get something back. So gifts and gains, effectively it's compromise. It's common sense practice. And the Fiordland Guardians have an underlying principle that guides everything they do. And that is that they set out to ensure that the environment that is inherited from them is at least as good, if not better, than what they took over. And that should be all of our combined objectives, Hmm. that we should be looking to leave for our kids and their kids something at least as good, if not better, than that which we inherited. And and I guess uh, we're thinking about that and as the new generations come in and the technology gets better effectively it should only be easier to do that well you would hope so anyway yeah I think so I think it starts with correctly identifying what the challenge is you know if you correctly identify what a problem is it's a lot easier to solve than if you go off on the wrong tangent and there are a lot of assumptions made you know, assume, make an ass of you and me. Yeah. It's a classic how often that, that occurs. And, and, and I think the, the, the sometimes suspicious relationship between rec and commercial is fostered by a lack of understanding of respective positions. And that's what we need to do, take the assumptions out of the mix and really work out uh, what the hell is going on? Identify the challenges and solve them collectively. Hmm. No, you know, it sounds simple, but it's I've seen it work. Who knows? Yeah. Um, this is a little bit off topic, but I read somewhere that you were the TV3 news uh, weatherman for. Oh, a I did weather for a year. Bloody Tell us about classic. that. <laughs> oh, it was it was freaking. I have to funny. dig some of those out of the file. Well, look. you know, you're reading a bloody teleprompter. So, so I get in there, they, they, they wanted me to do the weather because I was this outdoorsy bloke. But at the same time, I've been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So my legs were crapping out. And, and so we started doing this thing and the guys didn't want the wheelchair. So I'd transfer out of the wheelchair onto a stool. And so I'd sit on the stool and I'd point you know, to, to the maps and the various things. And I'd, I'd run little competitions and say, oh, you know, send me in a pointer. And I'm, I've still got a few of these things lying around. People would send all these pointers in. Uh, bloody fantastic. And away I'd go and do my thing. Um, I didn't like reading the teleprompter because I continually wanted to try and ad lib. Um, and in fact, early on I tried to ad lib and totally cocked it up. Um, <laughs> and and, and I, I remember... Um, I, I didn't get the the best grounding, I don't think. And I'm going, you know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to add lib. And the next thing I go, 
uh, and there's, you, you've got a headphone thing on, and I, and I hear, um, pull extenders, pull extenders, throw John, throw John. I'm going, shit, shit, who's throwing John around? It was John, yeah, John yeah. bloody Campbell. I go, what's pull extenders, what's going on? You know, and I must have looked like a bloody possum in a spotlight. <laughs> but, but effectively, I'd gone over time, and the extenders were the extra pieces just to tidy the mess up at the end and say, you know, thanks for tuning in, see you tomorrow night. Um, and throw John meant that I should throw to John. Yeah. And John, you might just have something to say, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Something to say just to finish the evening. And, uh, yeah, so that was a bit of a bloody shock. And then the next shock came when, you know, I was really starting to lose my mobility. And one day I spun round to bloody, um, uh, to point at the map. And my legs flew round and I couldn't get the bloody things back. So I'm pointing at, you know, and my legs are at this bizarre angle. And I couldn't move the bastards back. And I'm thinking, shit, I'm going to fall. I'm going to hit the deck. Yeah. And so um, that, that gave me a bit of a, a start. And I thought, shit, this could happen again. So I'd worked out that if that happens, I, I, I could land comfortably and I'd disappear off camera. But I'd just keep going. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, you know, you've got to have some fun. Absolutely. And then in the end, I put a proposal uh, to three to become the only wheelchair driving with a man in the world. But they, they wouldn't have a bar of that one. So I've got to go I, go. I thought we could have some fun. Yeah, definitely. Be out there on the boat doing, <laughs> doing the weather oh, report by the fishing rod well, in well, hand. You know, I did do the weather in some pretty interesting places. I remember doing it out of a hot air balloon, you yeah. know, in the Hamilton one day. Yeah. I went to the Hokitika Wild Foods Festival. That was bloody great fun. Yep. Um, yeah, some, some pretty interesting stuff. On the um, flight deck of a 737 flying to Queenstown. You know, that's some pretty pretty cool stuff. So that was just that was just an opportunity that came your way because... Yeah, of, yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah. It w- was an opportunity and I really enjoyed it in its own way. But it wasn't my love. You know, I really wanted to concentrate on gone fishing and some of the documentaries and things that I had a chance to... Um, to do, you know, one of which, the first one was Fjordland, um, and the second one was a documentary on the wreck of the Alingamite that sank on the Three Kings Islands in 1902. It had 17,320 pounds of old currency on board. Wow. Um, and I think Kelly Tolton thought there was enough silver basically to represent about the size of a, an old Volkswagen Beetle car. And so it was Bloody worth hell. having. And in those days, silver, when Kelly um, and my good friend John Pettit and Wade Doak and a couple of other guys got up to the Kings and found that wreck again, and they started salvaging, silver was being used in the photographic process quite, a, quite extensively. It was worth a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, and not only that, there were 6,000 half sovereigns of solid gold on board that ship. So I met my old... My guys become my, my good friend John Pettit in, in the filming of that story and we went up there and anchored over the wreck for the best part of a week uh, and found our own coins and, How deep was that? Or? Oh, I mean, I, I think feet oh, yeah. But it, yeah, well, Italian metres but it, you know, most dives were 40 plus metres wow. um, and we were doing you know, up to three of them a day yeah. you know, Couldn't compre- stay too long down Decompression there. dives so yeah. you come up to 20 feet You'd have a line with tanks at um, you know six meters and tanks at three meters, and just breathe your way back to the surface. Yeah, okay. But that was that, that was sensational. I remember old John Pettit telling me that when they first went up there, and he remembers that when they found the coins, rubbing his hand across the surface of the sand, and these coins were popping up like magic. Wow. So and then he, he said um, he was saying. I remember one day, you know, we, uh, Kelly was working in the wreck and he kept knocking his head on something. So he turned around and hit her with his hammer and bloody, the, the thing he was, he, he was knocking his head on fell down and it turned out to be the coins. They'd all cemented themselves together and it was just this great mound of coins. So Kelly liked using gel ignite. So he'd gone to night school or something and worked out, you know, how to use explosives underwater. And so he set some charges on the bloody wreck. And apparently what happens at depth is the 
the impact of the charges is greater than what it might be on the surface. His calculations are so, wrong. His calculations, he blew the bloody thing to bits. So you see, there were coins just everywhere. <laughs> so, so to this day, you can go and dive on the wreck of the Alingamite. That's so it's not for the paint. It's like proper and fine treasure coins. hunting sort of stuff, isn't it? That's oh, amazing. Yeah, it's bloody sensational. It's a pretty rare opportunity to to have something like that happen in this day and age, you know, it's like, um, yeah, it sounds yeah. like something out of a movie, you know, tre- treasure hunting, yeah, yeah, well, up for gold. And... Well, effectively, it was that, that adventure, that excursion that put Kelly Tolton on the map. You know, it was Kelly the treasure hunter, and then Kelly Tolton's underwater world, and, and unfortunately, Kelly very, early, very early on uh, died, um, which was a bloody incredible shame. But, you know, to have an old fellow like JP comes up and he and I will share a bottle of wine and he's 90 now and to, to hear his stories and see those those 90-year-old eyes glow with, you know, with... with Reminisce, with the, passion. The, 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 the passion is just incredible. That's awesome. And that's why we have to have adventures. So that if you wind up in a wheelchair like me or you wind up as a 90-year-old fella... You've got something worth looking back on. Yeah, oh, that's... You've yeah, got to have something to talk fantastic. about over a beer when you... Too yeah. bloody right you do. That's so cool. Well, I, I didn't even realise there was a wreck, a wreck like that around here. Yeah. So, like you say, it is a bit like... Oh, there's, a, there's a few of them. I mean, the Tararua, which was lost off Waipapa Point, down in the Catlins, was huge loss of life. She had a whole bunch of silver on board, a lot of old worn crowns, which were five shilling pieces uh, so that had you know quite a lot of value uh, and then the most famous one is the wreck of the general grant which was a ship sailing out of melbourne uh you know back to across the southern ocean into europe had the three king's islands and you know, clunk a lot of people died but she had two and a half thousand ounces of gold in the manifest Holy and shit. a lot of people who'd been prospecting for gold returning home so no one knows how much gold went down on that ship. But there have been a number of trips down there looking. And to date, no one's found the wreck of the mm. General Grant or the bullion. We'll be looking at scuba gear on Trade Me tonight, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it, yeah. Some of these things are not for the faint-hearted. No, I can imagine. I did my dive course a, a long time ago, actually. And yeah, I think the, the deepest I went was, uh, it was about 15 metres, and, and that was deep enough. Uh, and I don't... I haven't actually done it for a long time, so I've pretty much forgotten everything. I'd have to redo my ticket, I think. Well, in the mid-80s, I had shares in a charter boat based in Milford Sound. You oh, could never get on the bloody thing because we were always on it. Yeah. In fact, I lost <laughs> you know, any residual money I'd saved. I lost on that business venture. I, I went absolutely broke over that. But I had a couple of years of uh, hunting, diving and fishing in Fiordland that I'd never trade for anything. It's a bit hard when you ring up. No, no, we booked out Graham's on it again. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and it was trying to get a skipper who was reliable and people were turning up and not being treated as they should have been. It was, it was fraught. Uh, you know, you, if you're going to run a charter business, you have to make sure it's people first. You got to look Customer after service. Your, you've got to look after your customers. Speaking about safely, um, the Fiordlands and some of these big deer that you caught did you ever see the uh, elusive moose down there no but I, I went looking for moose oh yeah yeah very good friend of mine that I hunted with well when I shot that deer anyway Ray Tinsley wrote a book Call of the Moose and in Call of the Moose are some of our trips and adventures and uh, yeah apparently one was seen recently I saw something like about a year ago eh? or it came up yeah, again even Less than that, because it'd be quite old by now, wouldn't it? It was. It would. Yeah. Well, they live a reasonable length of time. I mean, the moose man is uh, Ken Tustin, who lives in Tiana. He he's a hell of a good guy, Ken, and he's been passionate about moose. He said, you know, camera remote cameras in the bush, uh, trying to trip them up, and he did take one photo, and this bloody photo had snow or water or something on the lens, and when you look at it, it's not a deer. It's definitely something else, and he blew the photo up, and without doubt, I'm bloody 100% sure that's a moose. 
Oh, interesting. So, yeah, yeah. So they could so, still be there. Oh, this might well, have been a while ago. I think if that was indeed a moose, and the guy who made the call knows moose because he'd been a guide in British Columbia, um, or, or in Alaska it might have been even, he knows what a moose looks like. So if that was the case, and there is still one or two there, wow, that's pretty incredible. Do, so it's got Ken excited again anyway. Do they cast their antlers like deer do? Or? Yeah, they do. Oh yeah, so that's another But there's, look, if they're there, yeah. it would be... Needle in a haystack. Absolute needle in a haystack. And they're, they're not, they're a big animal, but they're, they're a little, they're stealthy. I mean, that countryside down there is um, pretty steep and pretty thick bush in that. Yeah, not, but some know. of the areas where the moose are likely to be are just dense. And not necessarily the steep hillsides. You know, there are areas of where there's kind of swampy country and quite tight scrub. And, but, you know, hundreds and hundreds of bloody helicopters are flying back and forth chasing deer. You would have thought that one of them would have caught up with one eventually, but no. Nah. Anyway, Ken, Cut, Ken Tustin wrote um, a great book. His last book, I think, on moose was The Nearly Complete History of the New Zealand moose herd. And he remains hopeful. <laughs> Worth a read? Worth getting a copy? Yeah. Yeah, got a copy there too. Oh, cool. You can have a squiz. I'm, I'm not, I haven't been hunting it. Every time I, like Tony, Tony's Tony been and a, a few of our other mates are into it and sometimes they come back, you know, days or weeks without seeing anything. And I always, I've only ever seen deer in, you know, farms and stuff that, around New Zealand. Never, I've never seen one in the wild. And, uh, my in-laws live in the UK and they just have herds of deer come onto their property all the time. And it's like, oh. I, I just don't understand how, you know, and maybe it's just because there's so many more people over there. They well, just, I was a naughty boy in England when I was over there in 86. <laughs> mm. I persuaded a bloody publican in the pub I was staying in to actually loan me a 22 because there were rabbits all over the place. And when I got up the next morning, Slightly the worst for wear, I might add. Um, I went and looked over one of these stone walls. Bugger me, here's these little deer standing there. I thought, oh, too bloody good to miss. So I popped one and uh, gutted it in typical Kiwi fashion, took it back and put it in one of the outbuildings, uh, which was a concrete floor, kind of laundry area, and um, spread it out so that the, the cool air would cool it down. And the next thing, I, you know, I went back to bed and had a shower and went back to bed. And uh, I don't know, probably a couple of hours later, there's this shriek, and this guy's saying, You Antipodean poaching bastard! <laughs> you know, I'd shot Lord someone's bloody deer. Oh, pet deer. Not pet, <laughs> but he owned the buggers apparently. So, you know, was... I've been on a train that's just mowed down a whole bunch of them because they're just running across the tracks. Oh, they're they're just God. everywhere, aren't they? Crazy. Cool. Yes. Oh, good. And where do you, uh, have you got more seasons of Ocean Bounty coming out? Yeah, or? I'm just yep. filming Series 4 at the moment. Oh, cool, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know... Can you give us some insights? What's it about? What, well, there's a, there's a bit of stuff. At the moment, I've got cameras on a vessel about now going around Cape Horn en route to the Falklands. Uh, we're filming a story on Stewart Island. Some amazing stuff going on down there. Um... We've just filmed in Westport and Nelson, studying the Westport School of Commercial Fishing. Uh, and then on the bridge with a guy who started in Westport as a, you know, as a deckhand and has worked his way to be captain. Um, you know, as a career opportunity, commercial fishing's a bloody mind blower. You get a lot of time off. When you're at sea, you don't spend your money. You, you, so you get off with a good amount of money mm. and it's amazing how many young people men and women are very quickly getting their own homes getting assets behind them and doing incredibly well and you can start on 60 to 80 thousand dollars a year i mean come on that's good money yeah and you get on the bridge you could be earning four hundred thousand a year Ooh, I mean, as a shit. career path, yeah. it's pretty impressive. You get six months off of the year, they reckon. Eh? Well, and not starting, yeah. but once you're on the bridge, it's trip on, trip off. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. So, you know, I'm just exploring 
that is an opportunity, especially after COVID. You know, gee, uh, if you want a career, worth considering. Mm. And yeah. we can't get enough young people to fill our ships here. You know, we're having to bring in crews from elsewhere. And a lot of um, a lot of people might be thinking, visualising a commercial boat as an old steel rusty hull with a oh. swinging hammock in the hull. But um, of from some of the footage you've shown, they're they're pretty um, pretty they're high. Pretty bloody comfortable. Yeah, pretty comfortable. And the food is sensational. Mm. Chef on board and yeah, whatnot. chefs on board and. You know, gee, everything's everything's. I guess if they, if they can't get people to, to work on them, they, they, they have to make it appealing in, in some way, right? And the money and the sort of the lifestyle that goes with it, it has to be working hand in hand. The, the, the people that have made a career of working in the commercial industry love it. And as some bloody characters, like, God, oh, some characters. I don't mean that in the nicest possible way. <laughs> and salt of the earth, good people. Honest people, you know those the people that I most respect, the people that will look you in the eye, shake your hand, and their word is their bond. I love it. We'll have to get some uh, names and numbers off you because we want to talk to a few of them, don't we? Yeah, we'll oh, to go out one. Fun, no so problem at all. Yeah, cool. yeah. I think you should. Yeah. This is a different point of view, you know. So. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, like we said before, you know, we, we've got to be open to everything and, and just sort of understand and learn ourselves what, what's, you know, what's going on. And you know, there's people like you, you know, help, helping to explore that. But you see, Ocean Bounty to me has been like going to fishing university. It's just been an eye opener, and, and and people need to know this stuff, need to have conversations with these people, because it it makes you immensely proud to be a Kiwi. Hmm. God, there's some good buggers around. It's so interesting too, even if you're not into your fishing, like um, like if I sit down and your wife's watching or something, they're, they're right into it as well, you know. They're like, oh, that's amazing, or I didn't know that, or yeah, it's a good good show. So. Yeah, but there's a whole lot of other stuff we're doing too. There's a, a drone survey getting underway on Maui dolphins. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're filming that, seeing how that works. Uh, and a lot of the fishing companies invest in a lot of environmental support programs that they never get credit for. You know, they want to know more about the ability to keep separation from such things as Maui dolphins and, uh, and commercial fishing boats. And if we know where the dolphins are, maybe we can better plan and better accommodate everybody, you know, rather than shutting up vast tracts of coast. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a fair shout. And, yeah, I was sort of thinking about that before when you were talking about the dolphins and... Yeah, it, like drones, perfect, perfect innovation to start, you know, finding and, and surveying them and, yeah, and all that sort of stuff. Another example of how clever Kiwis can be. Let's use new technology, or relatively new, and, and make it work um, for everyone's betterment. Hmm. See there, like GPS um, scanning with drones, um, the kiwi fruit orchards down to Pukki and stuff now, and they can tell you, where the um, so where the fruit was picked off, and then once it goes through the factory, they know exactly what vine that came off where, and they can figure out factors of like different sunlight and really? drains. And so it's not just here's thirty ton of kiwi fruit that came off this orchard. Each individual piece of fruit, when they do the testing on it, they can they know exactly which mm. plant. It's a, yeah, incredible. You see the drones flying all over them. And, wow! Yeah, it's just the way every, all the industry's going. It's, mm. So you know, if you want a summary on this. You know, I started life as a person that did not have a great respect for the ocean or the environment. You know, I was brought up to believe that it was a food basket and it was my privilege, well, it was my right to help myself. It's, it's actually a privilege mm-hmm. um, to be able to harvest what we harvest, to me as recreational divers and anglers. And with, with privilege comes responsibility. And that's what I've learned in recent years, you know, to take responsibility uh, and maybe sometimes limit my take. Uh, it's easy for me because, you know, I've got a, a frequency of trips that enable me to always have access to good seafood. Other people who go out might have a large family and it's their right to take their limit and they might choose to do that. Um, but sometimes it's nice to make choices that actually acknowledge 
a contribution. And for all of us, the contribution is managing sustainable fisheries going forward and, and ensuring our environmental practices are sound. I think that's, and that's uh, something I've only learned in recent years. Uh, you know, and yeah. our kids, fortunately, are growing up with that. Yeah. I think that, I think that sums it up perfectly. And I think that is, that's really, really good. Do you have any highlights of gone fishing? I know it was a lot of seasons, oh, look, but any... You know, people have, trip? people have... No. Honestly, I, I can't. You know, we're going to have a beer, aren't we? Absolutely. Yep. Right. So, I'm sorry if you're listening, but you won't be privy to some of this stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah the story, some of the stories will be told when I'm gone. I'm bloody sure of it. But it is a privilege to do what I do, and I met an endless array of fantastic people, some of whom are no longer here. Um, but when you sit around and you have a beer and you meet people again, you're reminded constantly of some of the things that you've done. And that in itself is just sensational. So I can't honestly think of any one thing or one trip. You know, there are places like Fiordland that I, any excuse, I'm always back down there, or the Three Kings, you know, diving and fishing on the Kings and the wreck of the Alingamite and all those things, and Marlin and Kingfish at the Kings, just a sensational place. So there's those, but, you know, I just love going out in my, my backyard here, uh, launch boat ramps a couple of minutes down the road, chug out, catch a feeder snapper, come back, have a feed, have a beer with, a, with friends, uh, and, and I reflect on what a privilege it is. So is, so, it, so is adventures, isn't it? This oh, goes back to that. But, you know, adventure too is, a, is an interesting term sometimes. You know, adventure is not necessarily going and busting your ass in Fiordland or, you know, getting your bloody backside kicked at the Three Kings in a stall. Um, sometimes an adventure is sharing time with friends uh, and unwinding and cooking the proceeds and uh, great memories. Cool. Great memories are adventures for me. Good stuff. What sort of boat have you got at the moment? Got a seven metre Surtees. Oh yeah. The 250 Honda, four stroke on the back. Cool. Yeah, I, uh, when I'm allowed on it, <laughs> it seems to disappear. Up north quite a lot, the sun's up there all the time. Oh yes. Clocking up engine hours. Yep. Yeah. Coming back with an empty tank of gas. And <laughs> yeah, well, he's smart enough to know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it's better to be in the water than sitting out, outside of it. Yeah, but you know, boats are like fishing gear uh, and rifles and calibers. And everyone has different ideas of what's best, what works, what doesn't. Uh, and these days, too, you know, our ability to catch fish has changed dramatically. You know, our, our electronics, uh, you know, it's the same stuff the commercial guys use, basically. We can find fish. We can go back to the same spot time after time. Uh, we've got techniques that, that I'd never heard of growing up. We used to use dirty old bait and a hook. Well, now, you know, you've got slow jigs and bloody... You, know, you, you just, like, you know yourself, soft baits? What the hell is that? Gee, first time I used soft baits, I couldn't bloody believe it. They were sensational. Kaburas? What's a kabura? Unbelievable. Do the damage though. Who would think that a fish would eat a, a piece of coloured lead with a hook under it and a couple of tassels? Well, I guess they're not that bright. Doesn't even look like anything, you know, it doesn't look no, like a bait fish or anything. But they like. work. This, you know, oh, some of the stuff. It's exciting. You know, I go out in the, in the boat and there's probably 10 different options that I can fling over the side. And sometimes, some of the people I go with won't use anything but soft baits or slow jigs because they don't want to get the smell of fish on their hands. Oh, our times change. <laughs> the old half a kawa head or a yeah. cut open jack mackerel or something. Yeah. Right, did you have any, any other questions or 
Do you want to talk about anything else, or should we? Uh, so we've got these things that we're calling quick cast questions. There's only five of them, and they're, they're just short, quick little questions. But if you got anything else you want to talk about first, or no, I think that's sort of come pretty. Been a pretty that. epic, a good length, conversation, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's amazing life and story so far. Yeah. yeah. You happy? What are the five questions? What are the five questions? Right. Biggest fish. Uh, unknown. Marco shark, maybe 300 kilos at night, uh, off the Three Kings, scared the living daylights out of me, came to the boat in about five minutes, tagged and released it. Wow. Wow. Most memorable fish, it might be that one too. <laughs> no, most memorable fish is the broadbill swordfish on the wall, uh, which, that was a great story, the, the old sword. It's yeah, the only one I've ever hooked and the only one that we've collectively landed. Product of teamwork, my legs were not good, uh, but we got it two and a half hours. Whereabouts is that? That was off the Three Kings, middle of the night. Wow. Cool. cool. We'll take but, a photo of that as well. Yeah, it's, it's a good story, but it's not a, a minute. <laughs> oh, that's wrong. Um, best location fished and a dream location? Um, three Kings, probably. You know, in terms of that's where I caught the first marlin. Uh, that's where, uh, you know, I've had great diving, uh, both on the Alingamite and you know, Craze and Power and, you know, and, and it's a place where I've been able to take other people and share great adventures with them. I've taken a lot of people up there that I've been able to share their first marlin with. You know, so the Kings is, will always be special. And Dream? Dream location? Shit, getting back to Fiordland. Keeping uh, it local, eh? And you, and getting back to Fiordland for southern bluefin tuna, because they turn up, you know, end of Feb, and they're there for a, quite a long time. And out of the mouth of Thompson Sound, just north to Nancy, the continental shelf butts right in against the coast, and you can catch bluefin that you virtually have to haul off the rocks. Wow. It's, it's bloody sensational. I think the Fishing Adventure Boys got one mark uh, down Fiordland a couple of seasons yeah. ago. Yeah, good, good sized fish. Do you have a bucket list species or have you pretty much nailed them all? No, I, I, I wouldn't say I've nailed them all. My challenges have changed because I've lost the use of my legs and my arms are not what they used to be. Uh, so, you know, my desire to catch a different sort of fish has been superseded by just staying in the game, really. You know, I'm, I'm all about staying in the game. And I, I, as I say to anyone, I, I'm just happy to be out in the boat these days. As long as I'm on the boat and sharing that time with other people, especially family and friends, I'm very happy. That's a good, That's answer. A good answer, yeah. Uh, and to sum it up, do you have a favourite fishing style? Well, believe it or not, I, I love fly fishing. I wouldn't have picked that. I wouldn't have guessed it. No, you probably wouldn't. There's something serene almost about it. There's something, it's like an art form. You know, when you get that line in the air and when you're sight casting to, to fish and you lay that fly on the water just so and, and, and you hook one, it's it's engaging. It's phenomenal. I've never done fly fishing. Oh, I have to have a go at it. It's special. Didn't, I, I knew you wouldn't think that. Yeah, yeah. I, cool. If I was a betting man, I wouldn't have. Uh, but hey, that's coming from the guy that can't light a fire. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that's right. But, well, hey, look. Yeah. I think it's been fantastic. We really appreciate your time this afternoon, your I hospitality, your and time. the man cave, and, and Duke the dog, and indulging Tony's and fire lighting, and listening to an old fella's stories. Ah, this you know this is exactly what we're here for is is to hear these stories and hopefully share them with like minded people. So yeah, I don't know if you agree. Should we? Um, I'd be keen to hear the broad bill and then wrap it up. After, after well, that. we can do you that. Want to hear about got, the sword. Still I'll, got plenty of time. I'm looking at it on the wall now, and I think oh, maybe I'm sure. Okay, okay, tell us, tell us a story. I'll take a photo of it and you tell us the story. Right, the story of the sword was one of the Bay of Islands charter skippers, Chris Britton, phoned me up. He was skippering a boat called Taggart at the time. 
phoned me up and said, I hear you want to go and catch a sword. I said, too bloody right. The former leaves completely crap out. I want to go and haul in a sword. He said, OK, I've got a three-day window coming up, and if the weather's looking good, we can go. And uh, he said, we'll probably go off North Cape and um, just s- see how we go. And in those days, we fished for swords at night. So you go out at night, uh, you had to have good weather. We had perfect weather for three nights. So went out off North Cape. We had one bait out uh, on a balloon, down about 100 feet or so, and another one out, and you try and keep them separated, um, and down at a lesser depth. And you drift around out there and amongst this bloody geography that pushed that pushes up wellings up and bait and you know the big predators are in there like the sharks and things. So the first night we go out and uh, I think uh, Sandy caught a, a Marco, a Macaba, um, Owen Young caught another one and then just near daylight I hooked a fish turned out to be another Marco, three Marcos. The next night, the second night, we go out in the North Cape trenches again. Nothing. Not a bloody thing. We drift around all freaking night and got nothing. <laughs> so the skipper said, look, we've got one night left. He said, I know that way the hell outside the Three Kings, there's a seamount. Um, he said, I've calculated that we could get there just on dark if we leave now. So this is morning of, you know, day three. And, and we had a chat about with it. Let's go and have a go. So we set off for this seamount way out beyond the Three Kings. I mean, we must have gone 100 bloody miles down there. We went a bloody long way, I know that. So we wind up in the middle of the friggin' ocean, in the middle of nowhere, just as darkness falls. And we drop one bait down about 100 feet, and we drop the other bait down a lesser depth. And as soon as we drop the first bait, we're putting the second one down, first bait goes off. Bang! And away we go. Worth the trip, eh? Bronze, no. Oh. Bronze whaler. Probably a couple of hundred kilos. And sharks at night are a bastard. Because they come in, they come cruising in quite quickly. You can get them to the boat quickly. And then they kind of roll on their side and they give you that look. The toothy <laughs> grin. You stick a gaff in me and I'm going to jump in there and I'm going to chew your arms <laughs> and legs off. Type look. So anyway, we were tagging and releasing these sharks. So, next bait. Another shark, next bait, another shark. Went freaking on and on and on. And then finally, and I was participating, and finally um, Owen McCobber hooked this bloody fish. He hooked this freaking thing and it roared off down the side of the sea mound and it just about spooled him and, and, and away he went. And next thing after an hour and a half or so, I hope you're not hearing this, mate, he goes, oh shit, my back's starting to hurt, you know, and then my arm's starting to hurt. And, you know, two hours, two, two and a half hours, two and a half hours into the arc of light in the cockpit cast by the deck lights come, glides this fish. And bloody um, Brad, the, the deckhand, takes a wrap on it and starts pulling on the leader and into the arc of light glides this fish freaking great big bronze whaler shark hooked in the pectoral fin so it was just hooked in the side fin that's why we couldn't get the bloody thing up and it saw us all and it freaked out and it took off and brad had taken wraps on the leader and he flew across the cockpit and 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 got the wraps off slammed against the side and fell into the cockpit if he'd gone over side probably would have lost him so he gets up with these big round eyes and said something like, Christ, health and safety wouldn't like that, you know. <laughs> and, and anyway, you know, it's funny, it was all fine. And we were, you know, life jackets on um, and we had light sticks and whistles and all sorts of things just in case someone did go over the side. So Owen gets out of the game chair and he goes, oh, mate, with your bloody bag, there's no freaking way that you could do this. And I'm going... Oh, shit. Well, I'll pull out then. So, and Sands going, oh, you never give up. And I'm going, I'm not giving up. I just think it's smart. If I can't physically do this job on a sword, if that's what a shark does, what the hell is a swordfish going to be like? So, um, 
you know, that continues for a while. I pull out, Sands catches another bronzy, Owen catches a Marco, and eventually the skipper comes up to me and he goes, this is the last bait. It's the last night, true as I sit here, last night, last bait, do you want it? So the guys help me into the game chair. The skipper starts feeding the bait out. Feeding it out, feeding it out, feeding it out. Takes his hand off the bait. And the reel, the ratchet on the reel is going click, 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 click. And I look at him and he goes, it's not me. It's not me, mate. Click, 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 click. So there's fish on the bait. So with that, we fire up the engines and smack the drag up. And all hell breaks loose. Two and a half hours later, swordfish. Awesome. Wow. Last bait of the trip. Last bait, the last night, last throw of the dice, sword. Meant to well, be, eh? Never give up. Good stuff. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's a good way to end it. Yeah, I like that. All right. You Fantastic. Boys, you boys still telling fishy stories. No, yeah. stop now. Can't oh, even be here. Yeah. Cool. All right, team. That's uh, Graham Sinclair. Yeah. We'll, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Graham. You're Thanks very much for great, looking me up. Great ambassador for and role model for fishing in New Zealand. Yeah. Cheers. Perfect. Perfect.